It's very nice to be here in Paris and uh, in a circus tent. Uh, actually, in doing things like Maker Faire, you always look at what the environment is. And I think it's kind of fun that they chose a different environment here today than a traditional convention hall and, and places. And, and it makes you feel you're doing something different. So I, I want to talk to you about, I think, maker culture um, and how it might connect into a lot of these ideas here. But I'm, I'm using the word culture instead of economy, kind of intentional, because I think culture is a bigger deal. It, it, is, in, it is something that, uh, at least from my view, M Maker uh, has, it, it has tried to incorporate a, an idea of participatory culture. These are things that we do and therefore we create new things. Um, makers are enthusiasts. Uh, and I use that word because it ties back to early computing. It ties back to generations of hobbyists and others that, that found something they really love to do. And in fact, they probably love to do more than one thing. I think what's happened that's a little bit different around making is the idea of sharing. If you were an inventor 20 years ago, you probably clutched those ideas and held on to them as a secret. You worried about people ripping you off and taking your idea and selling it. In some ways, maker culture has defined sharing as the default. It, it still allows and encourages people to keep their ideas private if they feel it has their commercial value. But in some ways, they've begun to use it as a sort of social currency so that people know who you are, they know what you make, and you begin to connect to other people on that basis. So the idea of the lone tinker, the lone inventor, is, is in a sense outmoded in this culture. It's something that we think of more the social tinker or, or the um, uh, uh, well-connected inventor. But part of where I at least would like to convince you today is that making is so basic and fundamental to who we are that all of us are makers. It's not just some special group who went to the right school or who had a dad who taught them how to do something. It is something that's in all of us and it's something that's very broadly available in our culture. And yet, it really is something for the last, say, 20 years that has been on the margins of the culture, not in the mainstream. But I want to show you some forms of making uh, and, and show you how basic they are. This is learning to solder. It's something that's done at every maker fair. It's probably done in every makerspace and fab lab. It's, it's an entry level activity for making today. Uh, and it combines enough components such as you're using a, a soldering iron that's hot and you could burn yourself. You're melting something, solder, and you're connecting and putting two things together. Very basic but somehow very satisfying. An average Maker Faire, like we do in the Bay Area, will have almost 10,000 people learn to solder. Now this is another basic form of making, which is really unmaking. Um, and I just came across this at a small Maker Faire recently, but I'm gonna show you a, sm a short video. And... Uh, <laughs> It's a kind of music, of one starting a beat and the other picking it up and imitating it. But beating the heck out of old electronics is, is uh, a form of making, exploring what's inside and how things work. Let's see, next, there we go. I'm Richard. Whoop, let me go back to this. This is a form of making uh, that I, I came across at Maker Faire Seoul in Korea last summer. And these are dolphins, obviously made of wood, but they're controlled by an Android phone. And you can come up and, and change the, 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 uh, the pace of them. And a really beautiful, beautiful piece of, of work. I don't think the person who created it thought of himself as an artist. Uh, he just saw the potential for doing something interactive. I'm Richard Carter, this is and another this is the Sashimi Tabernacle Choir. When you hold in your arms, so tight, you let me know, everything's all right. Ah, 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 
basically there were these singing fish that were popular around Christmas a number of years ago and they were very, very annoying. And I realized that if uh, one of them was that annoying, how annoying could you make a couple hundred? So at that point we started building this car. Um, it is uh, computer controlled, uh, orchestrated, different uh, different banks of fish sing different parts in the various songs. Uh, we got soloists, we got a conductor. Um, it turned into a very complex project, but the core idea is just to make people laugh. Uh, well, so Richard, who's in the last one, is a physicist by day. This is something I saw last just last weekend at Maker Fair in uh, Newcastle in England making something that makes something, a robot. Yeah, that's just a bit, yeah, it's kind of creepy. <laughs> but they actually made the scarves and then had them out on their desks there to sell. It was, uh, and her, her finger work was, was quite intricate. It actually worked, uh, uh, which I thought was impressive. But I also want you to know, think about making it something that's so basic. We can do it with simple cardboard. Um, and, and today, almost giving kids permission to make is a big deal. Uh, it may not be in their lives in the way that it was once in their parents' lives. So putting out cardboard and basic tools um, is a way to get started. And I think there's also a way of looking at making as a series of building blocks, of putting things together, in this case, really circuit blocks where you're connecting a power source perhaps to um, I build a circuit to spin a wheel or, or uh, 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 drive a motor. Um, and I think that part of what has really fascinated me about maker culture is how accessible it is to kids once they get into it and how important I believe it is to their development. Making is also kind of borrowing from the open source world of projects. It's defined by and expressed through, this is the project I'm working on, here's the materials I've gathered for this project. And, and finally, really through things like Maker Faire, exhibiting your projects and sharing them in person or online uh, and talking about them. But um, I really uh, created Make Magazine around the projects and how to build projects. It was really borrowing from gardening magazines, cooking magazines, uh, even woodworking magazines. They all contain recipes of how to do stuff. And a lot of our technology magazines say, don't tell you how to do the thing that they're talking about. And I wanted to build a magazine that, that shared the basic instructions for how to build things. And to really sort of create the, the literacy around making that once was, I think, uh, more present in our culture. And then we've seen um, tools like 3D printers. Um, a, a new generation of tools come, uh, become available. And I have to say, 3D printing is something that just speaks to people. I, I don't completely know. Once you actually get it and try to build stuff, it's slow. It doesn't quite have the resolution you believe it should. But it's fascinating to take an idea, model it on a computer, send that to a 3D printer and see it take shape. Now, some of you might be old enough to remember laser printers. You know, when the early Apple computers came along, it was really the laser printer which drove the market for Apple computers because it introduced computing to a generation of creative people who had otherwise no use for computers. But they could design and create things and then send it magically to the printer. And the printer, that output, was what they shared uh, with others. And in some ways, this, so many years later, actually the, the patent for 3D printing was awarded the same year as a patent for laser printers uh, to Charles Hull, who, who's now for 3D Systems. But I think the important thing that the maker culture is built on is, the, is this sort of DIY pillar to realize that you can do things. And I like to think of it as, as, uh, as the starting point. It doesn't mean that you do it alone. It doesn't mean you do it by yourself. You don't need other people. It means, though, that the motivation and, and the reason we do things is very personal. I think the rise of makers and, you know, as I've done through the, through the magazine, um, 
you know, are, are a number of factors, such as uh, I've mentioned the open source projects and fabrication tools. But the internet has driven making because it's more, it's easy to connect makers to each other today. And those, uh, those connections be, form communities that uh, begin to create markets. Uh, I, I think if we see this in time, if you think about the relationship between things like uh, farmers markets in, in cities, um, how it was not only connected as, as a form of distribution of, of vegetables to people, but it did connect uh, the growers, the, the producers, to each other in, and gave them a, a, a way to make a living. I think we're going to see more of that as, as m sort of making continues to, to grow and expand. We don't quite have the maker's market version of the farmer's market, but there are a few experiments, and certainly online there are more of those. But I think what matters about making is probably the mindset of making. More than what we do, uh, it's, it's how we think about it. And, and, and I like to kind of say this is something you learn by doing. It's something that the mindset, I think you don't sit there and watch a slide and say, okay, now I'm this. But you experience it. And I think that these are some of the features that you're working across disciplines. Um, you're interacting with people, with physical things. You're in, um, which, which sort of makes it collaborative as well. Uh, makers are playful. And, and I think it's something that, in, in the context here, uh, sharing and, and uh, collaboration, these are elements of play. They're not always elements of commerce. And to some degree, making as play precedes making as work. And when I started the magazine, I thought that I just had this insight that play was how a lot of us uh, first, you know, it, it's sort of like the seedbed for innovation. It's, we take something apart. We try to do something with it. Um, we're testing out what the technology can do, but we're also testing out ourselves. What can we do with it? So um, I'm really important that, that uh, I think invention and creativity um, are, are really nurtured in, a, in an environment where we can play and the, the risks are, are relatively low. We, we expect to fail and, and we learn from failing rather than just by succeeding. There's something about making that's both certainly creative and subversive. Um, it wasn't subversive 30 years ago, but there's something about it that seems to, in, in a sense, undermine uh, mainstream culture. Um, at the same time, it connects to a tradition of that culture, so it, 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 it isn't just, um, in a sense, radical, it's also conservative. Um, making, I think, is self-organized. Um, uh, I don't have time to go into a lot of it, but the growth of maker spaces and fab labs around the world um, are showing us that this is a sort of a network of communities that are growing and even within those communities, but it's largely decentralized. Um, make, the maker movement has really grown as a grassroots thing. And I, once in a while I get people asking about how to do it, say, within a country or a city from a top-down perspective. Like, what's the role of government or, or leadership there? I think government can have a role there, but I don't know how you, you get the investment of people's time and energy um, if they're not helping to build it themselves. And lastly, I think there's this quality of optimism, of generosity to the maker movement. Uh, maybe it's idealistic, but uh, that sense of sharing, I think, is a cultural value. And, and kind of Nadia mentioned in the earlier thing, when I think of culture, I think of, it really, it's what we care about. And I think you see that in making, that we care about uh, what we build, what we do. We care about kids. And, and then sharing that and, and learning that. Um, and we care about solving interesting problems. So a couple of things just of, this is using the Roman god of uh, doorways called Janus, um, sort of looking both ways at once. Um, because making is both physical and digital in terms of both the tools and the media that, it, that we're using and the experience. But what's, what, I think was significant about make in the sense it was reconnecting to the physical world after we had 
sort of gone through a 20-year phase of just focusing on digital. So you can be a digital maker, but I think what's new about making is its reconnection to the physical world. In terms of participation, uh, I really think making is driven by amateurs. And it's a wonderful quality, a wonderful thought, I think, when you, when you, when you think about a lot of things. It, it, um, amateurs, the root of the word amateur is to love. And it's people who do it usually not for a business reason. They, they, it is sort of the basis of their social network, the basis of their own life's goals to do these things. Some of them do become pros, and some makers are pros and not amateurs. But th I think the growth of the maker movement is based on amateurs. Often when we think about making, we look at the finished product, and it's probably what is exhibited at the mag in, in the magazine or at Maker Faire. But the process is really... I think the, the key thing here, that we get good at a process. It could be a design process, a development process, a, a, lot, a creative process. It is the transferable thing that we're able to bring to new projects and to new products. It's not just what you end up with, but how you got there. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, my personal passion around this is sort of in trying to connect making into learning. Um, I think anybody who makes things knows they, they are learning while they're making. These aren't different things. It was certainly part of my own connection to the magazine was that I like to make things, whether it's beer or cheese or a circuit, because I'd like to learn how to do that. I'd like to learn, for, learn about it myself, not just read about it and not just know that someone else knows how to do it, but I'd like to try it myself. In schools today, uh, making is, is almost the opposite of what we're teaching. Um, we're focusing on textbooks and technology, and we're not focusing enough on the experience, what kind of process you engage in to make and learn. And I think the, the thing that I, I think has resonated with a lot of people, even those that don't see themselves as makers, is that this idea of people being defined as just as consumers is irritating, if not um, offensive. Um, I want to live in a world where we're all producers. We're all encouraged to create, to make. And we're, we're also, in terms of an economy, uh, cr uh, uh, creating value. It's not just something that a few people do for us. It's something that we all engage in. And I think successful companies, even those that sell products, will want to focus on how you engage your consumer as a producer. How do they add value to what you give them? And that's, in a sense, one of the things we actually have learned from software. And I think, um, to just iterate, I, I think where we see today in maker spaces and, and around our cities is sort of the growing of, of, of why this makes sense to do as a community, as, as something that brings us together. It's social. We learn from each other. Um, this is a, whole, a very different model than, than like doing this in your garage by yourself or having a teacher explain or lead you through something. This is something where you are actively learning from each other. So... Um, uh, pretty much I'm at, at my end here, but I, I guess to leave that, I, I believe this maker culture is, a, is something that uh, uh, is, is growing. It's accessible, visible to all of us. It isn't just uh, an economic thing, although I think it will have economic benefits. I think it leads to us rethinking factories, rethinking equipment and, and tools. But I think it's it's... Uh, the, the word I'd like to leave with you is it's participatory. It invites and encourages everyone to participate and become a maker. Thank you very much. You have a question? Or? Oh, can I do these two announcements? Yeah, all right. Okay, uh, public service announcements here. First of all, Saturday, May 4th, there's... Uh, Fab Jam here with a uh, uh, couple with the We Share Fest, and uh, that is uh, a network of 16 Fab Labs around the world are getting together, and you can 
go there and work on something. They've announced a theme, but um, the key thing here is it's, it's one day, one topic in 16 Fab Labs. And uh, you have to go online to fabjam.org and register to participate, but they'd love to have you participate. The theme of this Fab Jam is urban farming. So if you, I mentioned the farmer's markets earlier, but um, we're seeing in, in cities the return of farms and there's a need for small scale, uh, uh, tools for small scale farming. And I think that's one of the focus. And if uh, Julian is here, he was walking around with a book on some of that. He, he's done some interesting work. So Fab Jam this Saturday, chance to sort of get into the middle of a, a Fab Lab. And then I also want to promote uh, Maker Fair, the European edition. Uh, there's a call for makers out, ends June 2nd. Um, uh, this is our first really large fair in in uh, Europe, and uh, makerfairrome.eu is the URL, and it's October 3rd and 6th, but there's an open call to makers. If you'd like to participate and share what you do, um, go online and fill out uh, the information, and uh, I will look forward to seeing you at Maker Fair Rome. Thank you.